Well, hi, everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time to join the Arthritis National Research Foundation's final in a five-part webinar researcher spotlight series. I'm Emily Boyd Storman. I'm the CEO of the ANRF, and along with our board of directors, our staff, and those participating in today's panel, I'd like to welcome you to the spotlight on general autoimmunity. We're so grateful for your participation and support and appreciate your interest and time. We're also very thankful to our educational supporter of this program, Bristol Myers Squibb. Moderating the discussion today is the chair of the ANRF Scientific Advisory Board, Dr. Craig Walsh. Dr. Walsh, in addition to chairing our committee, is also a professor of molecular biology and biochemistry at UC Irvine and co-director of the Institute for Immunology and the director of the Multiple Sclerosis Research Center. Before we start the webinar, two important logistical pieces of information to note. One, the webinar is being recorded and we'll have it available on our website at a later date. Two, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them into the Q&A and we'll try to get to all of them. If we aren't able to answer your question, please email us at info at curearthritis.org after the webinar and we'll get back to you. Now let's move on to today's presentations featuring the impressive work of our ANRF scholars, who are all also members of the Scientific Advisory Board. Without further ado, I'm happy to turn the webinar over to Dr. Walsh. Well, thank you, Emily. And um, as Emily was saying, this is our, our final uh, in this particular series, and this has been sort of a new, uh, new venue for us. And today we're going to have um, members of our Scientific Advisory Board. And I just briefly wanted to give you, you know, an idea of what the SAB does. So. Uh, these are all really outstanding members of the scientific community, um, and, and in some cases, they're also physicians, and they're working with patients, and um, I think that the, the, the main role of the SAB is really to help to kind of direct the, the focus of our organization, as well as to um, review grant applications, and, and just to sort of plug a little bit about what the ANRF does, the main focus of the ANRF obviously is on arthritis and um, related autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases. But in addition to that, uh, one of the main fo fo foci of the organization is to support young scientists as they transition through their careers from postdoctoral work or clinical work into um, starting up their own laboratory in, in uh, primarily in, in academia uh, or, or research institutions. And uh, a number of us, including myself, have been former uh, ANRF fellows. So we've received funding that turned out to be really critical um, during a particularly vulnerable time as we're just starting out in our independent career. So the, the ANRF really plays a very key role and we're, we're all certainly delighted to um, basically kind of pay back a little bit of that investment that the ANRF made in us so many years ago. So without further ado, I wanna uh, introduce our first uh, speaker and that's PJ Utz, who is a professor of medicine at Stanford U University. PJ is the um, Associate Dean for Medical Student um, uh, Research and Scholarship, and he is the Director Emeritus. He was orig originally Director, now the Director Emeritus of the Medical Scientist Training Program, which is uh, basically a program that trains physician scientists who are really kind of at the forefront of um, medical science research and translation. Uh, PJ has published a number of really very important uh, scientific articles and, and does work both in basic science as well as kind of more translational and clinical sciences. So um, it's really a delight to have PJ here today and I will turn it over to you, PJ. Sorry, my bad. I've done this so many times I forget to turn off the mute and then our, the um... I'm not able, able to actually present. So let me start this over again. Are you able to see that? Yep, looks great. Great, okay, so thanks for the introduction. Um, as, as you've heard, I'm, I'm a practicing physician, uh, trained as a rheumatologist, and uh, I do two things. I run a research lab that is very focused on diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile diabetes, um, scleroderma, uh, that's one area. The other is that I run all of Stanford's medical student research programs. And so I'm very, very uh, passionate about training physician scientists. Uh, so ANRF is you know, clearly in the right place to be promoting that. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna start off by saying that my career is really focused on autoantibodies. And this is uh, an, an old paper from uh, 2020. And I put this up there for a couple of reasons. One is, this is work that was done when uh, I was an ANRF fellow. So I was selected as a fellow over 20 years ago. And it was a point in my career where I was thinking about uh, becoming a practicing clinician and giving up research. Um, and uh, ANRF said, no, we, we have the, we're going to fund your work. And so this paper was published on cell death and the role it plays in a disease called scleroderma. So my lab has worked in this area for the last 20 or so, or 25 or so years, but everything changed with the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And many of us had to shift our efforts into new areas. And so I'm gonna tell you about the rest of, of what we've been doing over the last year and a half. And I'm gonna make it very personal. So you've already heard that I was an ANRF fellow and I've dedicated my career to training um, young people and to, to studying autoimmune diseases, in, in particular uh, arthritis. This is a picture of my godmother. I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania, the home of the TV show, The Office. This is uh, her in Scranton. And she got COVID in January of this past year and almost died. She was hospitalized three times. And she now has long COVID. You can see her here with her oxygen. The story gets worse because my brother also uh, got COVID. Um, he, he survived her eight children. Um, Many of them, of her eight children, four of them developed COVID, three of her grandchildren. One of them has gone on to develop uh, renal failure and probably is going to have to go on dialysis. So for me, studying COVID and trying to understand what role it could play in inflammation and autoimmunity has been, um, it's been very personal. And so about uh, 15 months ago or so, uh, my lab started working in this area. And what we had been hearing from clinicians who were on the wards that they were seeing patients who were developing manifestations like new onset rheumatoid arthritis, severe arthritis, arthralgias, uh, blood clots, all kinds of other clinical manifestations that made us think maybe there's autoantibodies that characterize COVID-19. Maybe this virus has a unique ability to trigger autoimmunity and this could be an important discovery for us to explore over the next couple of decades, since we don't know how most autoimmune diseases start. Autoantibodies are, um, you know what antibodies are, and autoantibodies are antibodies against ourselves. And in most cases, they're thought to be pathogenic. So when you see autoantibodies, that's not a good thing in most cases. Um, so my lab put together this paper, it had almost 50 authors on it. Um, Several of these authors are, have also been involved with uh, ANRF over the years. It was published in Nature Communications, uh, which is a, a really good journal. And what we discovered in a nutshell is that in severely ill patients who have uh, COVID-19, a subset of them develop these um, new onset IgG autoantibodies. In fact, about 20 to 25%. The first thing that we did was to do anti-nuclear antibody testing. So for any of you who have have autoimmune diseases or you've seen a, a doctor and been screened for them, this is one of the tests that's done. Cells are grown on a, a microscope slide and then we stain them with blood from patients, from, from a potential patient who we think has an autoimmune disease. And if the cell lights up and it glows, that means that there's autoantibodies. And what we found in patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection is that about a quarter of them developed autoantibodies or had autoantibodies. And the patterns that we saw were really intriguing. They had, some of them had these very unique uh, nucleolar patterns that you typically see in scleroderma. Some of these are more what you would see in lupus, but this was not normal to see this uh, amount of autoantibody being formed. So what my lab then did was we asked, well, what are the actual molecules that are targeted? And I'm going to just show you really quickly what we did. We, we take these little tiny microbeads that you can only see uh, under a microscope, and we put uh, potential proteins that we think are our, the targets of these immune responses. So these are our own proteins, are coated on these beads and then incubated with blood from patients. And then if a patient has an autoantibody, it binds to a specific bead. And because we know what the protein or molecule is on that bead, we know what the autoantibody is recognizing. And it's in, um, done through this bead-based assay called Luminex. So this is the, the overall big picture finding that I want to present to you. And, and uh, that is that if you have severe COVID, 
versus healthy controls. So these are severe COVID patients. These are healthy controls. These are all the different molecules on this accent that could be targeted. And these are the patients. And what you're looking for here is red. If you see red, that means that there's an autoantibody. And if you look at healthies, they're scattered patients who have autoantibodies, but not very many at all. When you look at the COVID patients, it's a sea of red. It turns out about 80% of the COVID patients had antibodies against the hormones of the immune system called cytokines that float around in our blood. And then about 50% had antibodies against traditional things. So clearly abnormal, we should not be seeing this. Importantly, some of these autoantibodies are newly formed, meaning they're not present when the patient entered the hospital or got infected with SARS-CoV-2. But if you look later, they are. And this is just one example. They don't have to happen right after the infection. In this particular case, we tested a patient 20 days into her hospitalization. Nine days later, she had very high reactivity against this particular protein called IL-22. So the take home point is that it appears that this, uh, this virus is triggering brand new onset of autoantibodies, which we would say are most likely to be bad. Now, let me show you another example. So uh, this is uh, Nicholas Cordero. Uh, many of you probably know he was a, a Broadway um, uh, actor, very talented, and he died of COVID with multiple blood clots. And so it turns out that COVID causes a blood clotting, at least in a subset of patients, because it induces new autoantibodies that cause the clots. This is not my work. This really, these beautiful pictures here that you see of what happens with these antibodies, which cause blood cells to break up and, and you, you get these neutrophils that split open and there's all this inflammatory material that forms. This work was done by one of our ANRF fellows who was just selected, uh, Ray Zuo, who very elegantly showed in the science translational medicine paper that if you have these antibodies, this is what the clots look like. And if you don't have them, you don't have clots. So again, when you hear about clotting in diseases like COVID, they, this can be caused by autoantibodies. I'm gonna end with uh, just uh, two more slides. One of the questions you should be asking is, okay, if the virus can cause autoimmunity, what about all the vaccines? Is that also causing autoimmunity? And so Bali Palendron, who's here at Stanford um, with the superstar uh, scientist named Prabhu, um, we collaborated on this uh, paper published in Nature. We looked carefully at the Pfizer vaccine to see how it works. And I'll, I'll skip over all the biology of how potent this virus is and how we think it works molecularly. And I'll just go right to the autoantibodies. We screened the patients who got the vaccine at three time points before, um, they got it. Then when they got their second, their first shot or their second shot, and then uh, a couple of weeks later. And what you see is that there's almost no autoantibodies anywhere here. You do see some patients who had antibodies at baseline, but they don't change. And so in every single patient we looked at, there were no new autoantibodies and no increase in autoantibodies if the patients have them. So the, the big take home point here is that if you, uh, if you get severe SARS-CoV-2, there's a reasonable chance you'll develop autoantibodies, which could be bad. If you get vaccinated, we find no evidence that you'll develop these. So choosing between vaccine versus infection, I'll take vaccine every day. So I'll end here and just say, what these are the things that we don't know. And this is what we want our ANRF fellows to be doing is not just telling us what we already know, but to figure out what we don't know and to answer those questions. We don't know the prevalence of these antibodies in COVID-19. We don't know about other severe infections like influenza, although I'll tell you that patients with influenza do develop them. We haven't published it yet. We don't know if these are transient or if they're now permanent, if these people will also go on to develop autoimmunity itself. So we don't know if they'll develop the diseases associated with the antibodies. We don't know about long COVID and we don't know about what happens in patients with diseases like lupus. So let me stop there and take questions. All right, PJ, well, first of all, everybody, um, we tend to uh, give a little <laughs> virtual clap, virtual applause. Thanks for that. I, I have a quick question. Um, so sort of getting into the mechanism behind this. So do you think it's due to some sort of cross reactivity like molecular mimicry, which is basically where, you know, the uh, wh whatever the virus is or any other kind of pathogen that comes into the body 
um, it makes a component that kind of looks like self. It looks like one of our own proteins of, of inside our body. And that's certainly known to happen in, in a variety of viral infections. Or alternatively, do you think it has something to do with just shutting down the tolerance mechanisms that prevents our immune system from responding against our own tissues? Yeah, super questions. We think it's more likely that there's cross-reactivity between the self molecules and viral proteins. And we're trying to figure out what those viral proteins are. Um, we have, working with other groups, we've been able to make monoclonal antibodies from human patients who have been infected with SARS-CoV-2, as well as influenza, dengue, uh, and, and some other diseases, including patients with this APS1, this auto, autoimmune disease phenotype. And what we find there is that, that many of the patients have antibodies that mirror what we see in the serum, and many of them are would be predicted to be um, pathogenic. We also think that there's abnormal B cells that start circulating that are polyreactive, meaning they make antibodies that recognize more than one thing. Uh, and we're trying to, to study that in more detail now. Awesome, okay. Uh, Emily, do you have any, any questions? I should note, I, I don't know if we mentioned this early on or not, but if you have any questions, um, please feel free to type them in the chat and um, we, can, we can answer them that way. Yeah, a question actually from one of our current scholars, Dr. Singh um, asks, does COVID cause autoantibodies against IL-10? Yeah, it's a really good question. We have found a few patients who have had those antibodies. They don't seem to be inducible. It turns out that, um, I didn't get into this in the talk, but a subset of patients who get severe COVID have almost certainly have pre-existing antibodies against type one interferons that select for them to have a bad infection. But we've seen some others that are inducible. Um, the IL-10 antibodies seem to be relatively rare and don't appear to be inducible. Do we have any other questions, Emily? No, no other questions at this time. So I, I have another question real quick, PJ. Um, you know, some folks that get COVID, I mean, a lot of folks will lose their sense of smell, sense of taste. And so for some individuals that can be quite prolonged. And in fact, we don't know exactly how long it's gonna last. I'm, I'm curious as to whether you think some of these autoantibodies could potentially be involved in some of these neurological deficits that, that we're starting to see. Yeah, so uh, it's also a really good question. Um, I, I failed to mention that the, the NIH is funding post-COVID, so-called so post-acute uh, sequela of COVID or PASC, which is also called long COVID. They are pumping $1.125 billion into studying this. They've already uh, spent about 400 or set aside about 450 million for centers to collect patients and 17,000 PASC patients are being enrolled now. The thought process here is that a subset of the patients who develop brain fog and um, tachycardia syndromes where their heart races, probably a subset of them probably have some sort of autoantibody. Uh, Aaron Ring's lab has shown that there are antibodies against G protein coupled receptors associated with smell. I think it's probably not autoantibody re related though. I, the earliest studies have suggested that the, the support cells for the neurons that are involved in, in, in smell and taste are, um, are killed off and that it takes a while for them to come back. And um, that makes sense too, because smell is mediated by many, you know, what, like a hundred or several hundred G protein coupled receptors. Yeah. So taking, having antibodies against one, probably not, maybe you can't smell bacon, but you can smell everything else. Yeah. 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 All right. We have a question in the chat from Sharifa nurse uh, is if you have low COVID and do not develop autoantibodies and you receive the vaccine, what happens to the antibodies? Yeah. Really good question. Also, uh, we have looked at patients uh, so is that for long COVID or for low COVID? For long COVID? Uh, if you have low COVID, I'm guessing long COVID. Yeah, long. probably. Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer both of them. So if you, uh, for patients who have mild um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, we have looked at that in patients who were infected where we got samples within five days of their positive PCR test and looked at them 28 days later. We have samples for a year now, but we haven't run any of them yet. And the finding there is that it's relatively uncommon for patients to develop new autoantibodies. And the few patients who did went on to develop very severe disease. So that's, that's one answer. Now for the long COVID, 
Uh, it's unclear what happens with the vaccines. Uh, I've heard anecdotal evidence of some people who had long COVID who got vaccinated and then their long COVID markedly improved or went away completely. And that's raised the question of whether there's a reservoir of the virus and the, the vaccine helps to wipe out that reservoir. Uh, but I, I think those sorts of studies are being done to see what happens with autoantibodies um, in the vaccinated patients who have had long COVID and, and we just don't know yet. A couple more questions um, quickly. Just I know this is a such such a fantastic topic, and um, really appreciate your insight too, Doctor. So what are the possible implications from this research for patients who already have an autoimmune disease like RA or PSA? Uh, also, an excellent question. Uh, I'll answer it two ways. One is if you uh, if you are infected with SARS-CoV-2, I would say most of the data would suggest you'd be at higher risk for poor outcomes, worse outcomes. Um, but now with the antibiotics that are the antivirals that, have, that are now coming out and uh, the vaccines and the antibodies, I think that uh, th those are all good things. In terms of the vaccines, we are looking at patients who have, have autoimmune diseases and have been vaccinated. And uh, we haven't published this yet, but it looks like many of them have had really good antibody responses and we've not seen um, significant autoantibodies that have formed. Kind of leading into that uh, second question, is the immune response similar if one got COVID-19 or if vaccinated in respect to the autoimmunity? A really good question. So now it turns out that the immune responses are appear to be different. And um, the, uh, uh, the paper that we published, the Nature paper that Bali Palendron published, I think really nicely shows what happens when you get vaccinated. There's a massive increase the day after your second dose of interferon gamma, which is an inflammatory cytokine, and then the downstream chemokines or the, the uh, chem their chemokines are also like hormones of the immune system and they, they smell, uh, smell uh, things and they, they are chemoattractants or, or chemo, chemo um, repellents. So there's a lot that happens after that. Whereas with the, the viral infection, you have lots of different proteins. There's a lot of inflammation, a lot of tissue damage. I, and so I think there's overlap between the immune responses, but there's some important fundamental differences. Last question for me, Dr. Walsh, and then um, I know we wanna get to our other fantastic presenters too. Are there any other studies to suggest that patients with autoimmune diseases who do catch COVID have their diseases exasperated? That is a good question. I have not seen data that would suggest that that's the case. I'm just trying to think through the literature. Um, I don't think that that's been the case. So, um, and the same with the vaccines, we haven't seen exacerbation of disease. There have been some, some uh, relatively mild vaccine um, adverse events, but um, given the risk of getting the infection and having bad outcomes, um, so no, I, I think so far I, have, I haven't seen such data, but um, there are probably maybe others on, on this uh, webinar who might know more than me about this. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Oates. Um, obviously very, very interesting stuff. Look, look forward to hearing more about it. So we're going to move on to our, our next uh, presenter, who's, who's a new member of our scientific advisory board, and that is... Um, Giannis Adamopoulos, and um, Giannis is the director of the arthritis program at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center um, and a member of the faculty at the Harvard School of Medicine. Um, he's previously a professor at uh, UC Davis, so uh, uh, an alum, I guess, of the uh, UC system. Great to have you, Giannis. Love to hear what you're, you're going to tell us about today. All right, so let me see if I can... Uh share my screen correctly. Do you see, do you see my slides? Yes, looks good. All right. Okay. So thanks so much. It was very nice to hear uh, all this uh, immunology and how we can very quickly uh, switch uh, according to the needs that we have. Uh, if it's COVID, we will uh, change to show COVID. And it's been, someone said, oh, it, it was so uh, sort of amazing that um, all of these vaccines came in uh, uh, one or two years. 
where uh, actually they didn't come in one or two years. They came in years of work that uh, you know, people like we, we uh, actually heard now, they have been working and they're building up on the immunology so we can be able to answer all of those questions. So wh what I do is a little bit um, uh, actually different um, than, uh, so my interest is in psoriatic arthritis. And uh, 10 years ago, I was also funded uh, by the ASA Foundation. In fact, uh, I do remember the day because I was, I was in a parking lot with uh, three or four floors of cars. And I got a phone call just before I found my car. And they said, you know, it was the first grant I ever wrote. And I said, Yanis, you know, you got the uh, award. So then it was very hard for me to focus and find my car. So 20 minutes later, I was working, I was, you know, so walking around in the parking lot and the phone, and the phone call again, and it was, um, they said, oh, by the way, we didn't tell you out of the 13 grants we are giving this year, we have selected yours for the Sonberg Foundation. Um, so then I thought, I'm never gonna find my car. <laughs> I, was, I was walking around uh, excited and it's really, uh, so that's why I am actually here because uh, that moment of getting your first grant funded and you know starting is uh, something that we all sort of treasure. And I also wanted to show what I have been doing for the last 10 years after uh, I was funded. And that's why I've, I've also came back to serve this uh, very beautiful um, foundation. So um, what, what, what we have learned over the years, or we've been told for many years that arthritis is a sort of disease of wear and tear. And uh, we have seen most of us that this is not always the case. Uh, there are people who do not wear and tear. Their joints are really well, even in the very old age. And uh, on the other hand, we have people who are quite young. They didn't have any time for any wear and tear, yet they do have uh, inflammation of the joints. They do get arthritis. So, the idea of the wear and tear is fading away. <clears throat> of course, there is an element to it, but uh, the arthritis is mainly now considered as an immune disease. And an immune-mediated disease, one of the examples, one of the good examples of uh, that disease that, it's, that it actually involves the immune system is psoriatic arthritis. And this is one type of the 200 or more arthritis that there are uh, out there that affect the skin and the joints at the same time. And uh, skin can be actually treated to some extent with a lot of biologics, uh, but the bone inflammation uh, can sort of get uh, really complicated and it can cause a sort of permanent and, and then irreversible damage. So uh, this is, if it's actually left, uh, uh, actually untreated, as you can see here, it can cause um, uh, uh, very difficult problems. So, one of the things that I was very interested in is looking at how the skeleton works and how does this happen in uh, uh, actually arthritis. And I just wanted to give you a few um, uh, sort of slides for the uh, sort of background. And uh, during the bone remodeling, there's two types of cells, the osteoclast and the osteoblast. And those cells, they work together to sort of repair uh, sort of fractures um, throughout our lives. So it's not that our skeleton uh, gets uh, fixed during the uh, actual development and then it stays forever the same way. But uh, through our, throughout our sort of lives, we do have those um, sets that they work together. I'm not sure if I can play that. Um, and I'm not sure I can play that video, but um, let's try. No. Okay, so there's a video here which shows how the osteoclast and the osteoclast work. And, and what we do in my lab is we sort of take um, cells from people who have arthritis and uh, from uh, different uh, sort of models from uh, different mice. And we sort of culture them. This is uh, an elephant task that we use as a substrate. And we don't hunt elephants, but we do get elephant tasks from uh, different airports or ports where uh, people are, you know, trying to smuggle them in. And so, sort of, uh, and so recently, I had a donor who was willing to uh, give us thirty whale dentins. Uh, that would be a lot of um, uh, a lot of bone for us to a lot of dentin for us to sort of cut. And we grow those cells on that substrate, and we stimulate those cells, and we can see how the bone absorption happens here. And then we have the osteoblast, which is the layer of the new bone mineral. Um, and obviously, we use uh, different uh, imaging techniques to see those cells. And here is a scanning uh, 
electron microscopy image of the trabecular bone, which is the inside of this bone. And if you look very closely here, you will see that there is an area that has been resorbed by the osteoclast, and then there is an area that is being sort of smooth and it hasn't been resorbed. So this is what the osteoclasts do to the bone when we don't see, and if they continue doing that, then they should create these big holes around the bone, which uh, can cause a lot of many um, uh, other diseases. So the cells that, that do that are the osteoclasts. And I just don't want to go into any of the detail here, but I want you to understand that it's a highly complicated cell. It's a very smart cell. It's an energy demanding cell. It has a lot of different players that uh, are taking place into to bring the function of, of that cell. It is a multifunctional cell. It is an immune cell and it is a bone cell at the same time. So it does come uh, from a macrophage. So it is really an immune cell that contains to become a, a sort of bone cell when, when the need uh, uh, actually comes. And usually the osteoclast uh, stays sort of dormant until it gets activated by the osteoblast. And in uh, normal conditions, you have those two cells that they work together and they form those um, uh, sort of balance that we saw earlier and they maintain the skeleton. But what happens in inflammatory arthritis is that when you have an inflammation and this inflammation could be anything, right? Uh, we heard earlier about many different types of inflammation. It, it can be an infection, it, it can be a trauma, it, it can be a virus, dengue virus can also cause that. Uh, so when you have inflammation, those immune cells come and interfere with that conversation between the osteoblast and the osteoclast. And they start uh, saying different things. They start uh, adding to the conversation. And, and then the osteoclast is getting confused and it's getting more activated and it's, and it's acting to, and, and it then it's, it's, it sort of starts to resorb more and more bone. Now, if you take um, from the synovium of an arthritis as a patient, this is, uh, this is a synovium from a person who had RA. You can see that already has activated Osteoclasts, which they don't really, uh, you cannot really see them in uh, uh, healthy volunteers. Uh, I mean, if you take those cells out and you should culture them and you can activate them, you can see that those cells can resorb bone uh, very aggressively. And you can see what are the sort of mechanisms uh, and how they work and, 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 and how they do it. So we've, we've uh, published two years after our first, um, after uh, we got funded uh, from the NRF. We found that there's many different mechanisms that we're, we were not aware of before. Uh, it's not just a single pathway, but there are many different pathways that uh, actually contribute to um, that bone absorption. And, and also uh, in 2015, we sort of came together with the whole idea that there may be not just many different pathways, but there may also be many different cells. So it's not just a single cell that contains. So we, we knew, for instance, that uh, a macrophage could change to become an osteoclast, but now there are other types of cells that uh, they can also change. And they cannot be an M1 or an M2. They could be both. They could be an intermediate. It could be an, an immature DC cell. Uh, and in different types of uh, arthritis, you may have different cells and, and, uh, and different cytokines that, so everybody's, Arthritis could be different, uh, but the end cell is more or less the same cell that uh, actually caused the uh, bone damage. So we did some uh, animal models uh, while it was a neighbor with uh, uh, Dr. Woods at um, uh, DNAX, which is on uh, at the Stanford ground. And we sort of collaborated with uh, some of the people from uh, the gene transfer program there. And uh, we, we were able to actually make minocircus D of DNA that we can put them into the liver of the animal and then change the animal and make a transgene work. So make an animal sick by using a single cytokine. And what we found that if we overexpress certain genes <clears throat> that make this I-17 protein, then those mice could get arthritis and they could get inflammation. And you can see here the synovitis, the whole synovium is uh, actually inflamed. You can see the panels formation, which is typical in uh, uh, RA. And you can see uh, that the bone is actually destroyed in those, in those mice. 
We also notice that those mice uh, not only get bone disruption, but they, all, but they also get some skin inflammation. And they get skin inflammation, and you can see here their ear, uh, how it's, it's uh, sort of changing. This is a normal ear, and this is the uh, ear that had this IL-17 protein. And we notice that uh, similar to the human disease, where the sort of pathologists see those uh, sort of neutrophil exudates, which are called micro abscesses, we see them in these mice as well. And you can see the neutrophils here are sort of normal, but in the mice that have disease, they're uh, very highly elevated. Um, and then we did various experiments where we took uh, cells from mice that got sick, and then we uh, moved them to mice that they were healthy. And then we see that even those cells, if those, cell, if those cells are in the healthy mice, then they can cause disease. So we can separate then which, my, which cells are the good cells and which cells are the bad cells. Because there are cells that are good for human disease, they actually suppress the human disease, and there are cells that are bad that they make the worse. So one way of figuring out which of those cells are good and which of those cells are bad is to, is to try to sort them and put them in mice and see what they actually cause. Now, the reason why this um, inflammation of the neutrophils and the orthoclasts are sort of coming hand in hand together was uh, evading us for many years. But there was a paper that came up uh, very recently where it showed that the osteoclasts in the bone marrow, when they resorb bone from inside the uh, uh, bone that we don't really see, and, and, and you cannot see uh, in any clinical setting unless you do um, a, a very elaborate imaging technique, which you don't really use, uh, they make these small transcortical vessels and they make these sort of tunnels. So the osteoclasts move and they sort of dig and they make these tunnels and then allow the neutrophils to, co to come out from those tunnels and then they move everywhere to, to the rest of the body. And those neutrophils are the neutrophils that we saw earlier that are also there in uh, many different diseases. So in psoriatic arthritis, what happens in the bone marrow does not stay in the bone marrow. And, and, and this is one of the issues that um, is uh, very difficult to uh, uh, actually treat. So these are the mechanisms that we are working on. And, and my lab is sort of continuing to uh, sort of build on this. We just moved to a very new building <clears throat> in a very cold city. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I would like to thank all of the labs that uh, have helped uh, some of them uh, our, our sort of neighbors of yours there and some of them here, and then all the people who have founded them, of course, the uh, ANRF for uh, being the initiator of, uh, of, of, of all this work. So thanks so much. Thanks, Giannis. <laughs> really interesting work. Um, so I have a couple questions, and I don't know how far afield they are, but um, I know that um, TH17, so there's a special type of of CD4 positive T cell that expresses IL-17. And in particular, they seem to be very important for antifungal responses. And I'm curious if there's been any sort of analysis of, of these kinds of inflammatory diseases and the, the activation of you know, these IL-17 producing T cells in response to microbial infection. Is there a connection between the two? Yeah, yeah. so uh, that's a very good point. Uh, so the only comment I have to make, because uh, you know that uh, 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 actually very well, Craig, in this uh, sort of area, uh, there are many other cells other than the CD4 uh, positive cells that they make into lupin 17. And one of the things, and those may not be responsible for fungal infections, they may be uh, totally sort of different. So, and, uh, and, and one, of, one of my students who is also uh, on the call now, she's working on, uh, on alternative splicing of, uh, on alternative uh, uh, actually splicing factors that they may regulate the IL-17 in many different cell types. So cells that would normally wouldn't secrete any IL-17, they may secrete them at a naive state, right? So, so yes, the initial part was we all thought that fungal infections and IL-17 goes hand to hand, and uh, and also all the lectins with the dengue virus are uh, you know with the fungal infections. But it seems that um, this is just the tip of the iceberg, I think. Yeah, 
Uh, and then the other question, and, and again, this is kind of, I, I, I'm kind of reaching on this, but I thought it was kind of interesting. I mean, rank ligand, which you showed to be really important for this control of osteogenesis versus, or osteoclastogenesis versus osteoblastogenesis, uh, that also plays a really important role in T-cell development in the thymus. And I'm curious if, if that's just sort of by coincidence or if there's something to that in terms of the, you know, development of, of disease. It's, it's an extremely good question. It's a question that hasn't been answered since uh, 99, you know? And uh, I don't know why uh, people haven't uh, followed up on that. Um, this is, this is uh, the black box of, uh, of, of uh, you know, Rang Ligon, but uh, it's a very good question. I totally agree. I do not know the issue. The, the, um, they showed this when they made uh, the knockout mice. Uh, they uh, clearly uh, now documented it, uh, but then I haven't, I'm not aware of any follow-up work in the last uh, few years that has, uh, so the answer is, I do not know. Yeah. All right, other questions, either from the, the guests or from the panelists? Emily, do we, do we have, I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, PJ. Yeah, I have a real quick question. So is it, what happens with, if one uses mono, blocking monoclonal um, soluble rank ligand antibodies and put them into models. Does that affect T cell development? And the reason I ask this is that in our COVID studies, we've identified a number of patients who have pretty high levels of anti-soluble rank ligand. We don't yet know if they're blocking, but just curious to know your thoughts. Yeah. So I would. So about the T cells, I, I I do not know. But what happens with the anti rank ligand with the osteoclasts? is uh, the osteoclast seems to, to come up uh, from the fusion of many different cells. And there was a paper that just came out in Cell uh, last, uh, this, this year, I think, uh, from uh, an Australian group that Hal uh, actually visited uh, a few uh, years back. Um, and uh, they showed, uh, they talked about the osteomorphs. So they said that uh, when you give anti ranglinant you should repress those cells to go back to a state that are inactive, but they're not. They're like a, a sort of dormant cell. It's still there, but it doesn't express all the uh, information that you would otherwise. And they call those cells osteomorphs. And they talked about a recycling of, of the osteoclast. So why, so why they are thinking that in sometimes uh, when you give anti ligand you inhibit uh, so bone absorption, but when you take it out, it sort of you know, starts again. Is 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 sort of because you only repress the osteoclast to become an osteomorph, and then from osteomorph goes again to become an osteoclast. So I wonder if something similar happens with T cells, and I wonder if this uh, inhibition of development is actually a different state of T cells. Maybe it's pushing back some of the antigens that are expressed, some uh, TCR receptors or, you know, something. And it makes that, that cell look like a naive cell, whereas actually it's not so naive as, as we think. But this is just uh, a theory. Uh, I don't think anything has, but that's a very good question. That's a very good point. Okay, do we have any other questions for Dr. Adamopoulos? One more question, or actually two more questions. Uh, what happens to the body if the T cells are low and you have RA, or does RA affect the T cells? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, so T cells, uh, they need to be at certain levels in the body, right? Uh, the question is, uh, and they need to be at certain activation state. So it, it sort of depends on how those T cells are, are at, at what levels they are and how activated they are. So if you have overactivated T cells, we sort of get all of these nasty events that are associated with an autoimmune disease, right? So, but you do want, as, as Craig said, you do want some T cells to help you with fungal infections, to sort of help you with uh, your normal day-to-day uh, -day activities. You just do not want them more than that. So I think the balance of how much immune responses you have will actually dictate the outcome. And one more question for you. What are the clinical implications of your research for those who do have PSA? Yeah, so, so a lot of the things that happen is, 
uh, when when I, when I was working at uh, DNAX, we sort of made the sort of clinical candidate. So the uh, Al-17 uh, uh, actually minister was uh, uh, the data from that uh, uh, from that work were actually submitted for the FDA approval of the Al-17 antibody. That um, so I think it's it's very important to actually test something in mice. And, and once I thought that my job was done, uh, some of the clinical trials failed in, with uh, interleukin-23 or with I-17. And there were a couple of papers uh, in uh, sort of Lancet that they, they were like, oh, you know, we, we, we do have some issues. So a lot of the clinicians who, who were running those clinical trials, uh, they came back to me and we wrote a couple of papers, uh, one in the BMJ with, uh, uh, Dr. Christopher Ritzlin and sort of another one with uh, Dominic Baten, who actually headed one of the sort of trials in uh, ankylosing spondylitis, trying to figure out what are the mechanisms that we might have left behind. Because sometimes you may um, you may be able to solve a few things in a clinical trial, but there's not much room, uh, and that's why I sort of showed some of the uh, sort of experiments that we can do in uh, mice where we can sort cells, we can tag cells, we can put cells from one mice to another. So those experiments are really needed to, to guide the clinical practice, to sort of guide and see, okay, which is the cell that we need to target? Uh, do we need to target all the T cells or maybe some of the T cells? Because we don't want to target all the T cells, right? We don't want to have infections. So we want to, to maintain the infections away from us, but also don't get an autoimmune response. So we must find something on the T cell that will tell us that this is a good cell and this is a bad cell, right? So this is this is this is what uh, the clinical uh, implications are. But it takes a village to you know uh, bring all of those things uh, sort of together. It doesn't just take a scientist; it takes a clinician. It takes a lot of people to sort of uh, bring the outcome that we all need. All right, thanks so much, Giannis. We're gonna move on to our uh, next and last speaker, which is Hal Hoffman. And um, Hal comes to us from UC San Diego, where he is the chief of the division of pediatric uh, allergy, immunology, and rheumatology. He's also a professor of pediatrics and medicine and has been a long-term member of the ANRF um, uh, scientific advisory board. So it's really a delight to have you, uh, Hal. and. Um, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Thank you so much, Craig. Um, and thanks to the other speakers and for uh, everyone in the um, audience for, uh, for joining today. Um, I'd like to share my screen, but it's telling me I can't. I can talk a little bit while we figure that out. Dr. Uh, Adamopoulos, will you uh, stop sharing your screen and then uh, Dr. Hoffman should be able to join. Um, well, while we're waiting, um, so uh, a couple of unique things about me. I think we got it now. Um, so uh, I am actually trained in uh, pediatrics. So I'm um, a pediatrician, take care of kids um, with immunologic problems. Um, and my special training is in actually allergy and immunology. Um, but over the last 20 years or so, I've uh, had the opportunity to work with a lot of rheumatologists and, um, and especially been uh, very involved in the um, Arthritis National Research Foundation. Uh, so uh, a couple things you should know about me. Um, I'm a physician, so I see patients. Um, and for some reason or another, um, sort of similar to um, Dr. House, I end up seeing a lot of children with very unusual um, conditions. Um, hopefully, I'm a little different than him, um, a little bit nicer. Um, but uh, the other side of me is also I'm a, a, a avid surfer, and so uh, I do a lot of my best thinking um, between seeing patients and uh, working in the lab, also um, also surfing. Uh, so today, what I'm going to talk about is introduce you to a, a a newer form of immunologic or inflammatory diseases that are very different than autoimmune diseases. Uh, a lot of people do get those two terms. Um, uh, uh, confused. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the approach that we and many others in the autoinflammatory disease field have taken to try to understand these um, different diseases. I'll try to give you a better feeling for what the difference between autoinflammation and autoimmunity is. And then I'll tell you a little bit about how we're um, using what we've learned for um, these 
um, these particular diseases um, in order to try to find treatments that work really well um, in these patients. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, I'm a doctor and as I, as I mentioned, I see kids and, and that's where all of my research ideas come from. Um, I end up seeing children um, with their parents uh, who have sort of unusual presentations. Often they've seen multiple different specialists um, and they don't quite fit into the different boxes that, that different specialists see. Um, one of the most important things in, in evaluating these patients is actually getting a good history and trying to understand more about where, where to sort of classify it and, and put that patient. But then the other approach that we've taken over the last uh, 20 years or so is uh, using advances in, uh, in human genetics. And we've used a number of different techniques, um, including really old school genetics um, called linkage analysis, all the way up to now using uh, whole genome sequencing um, to try to identify the genetic basis for a lot of these different um, patients with unusual conditions. Uh, after that, after we identify the gene, either using those different um, techniques, then the hard part starts. Um, and that's when we try to understand uh, what that gene does. Sometimes we find a gene that actually a fair amount is known about, and sometimes we find a gene that very little is known about. Um, and we use a number of different techniques, some of that you've heard um, from Dr. Utz and Dr. Adenopoulos, in order to try to understand what those mutations in those genes do. Um, we oftentimes will take blood cells from our patients and try to study them to figure out what they do. Um, we also have developed a number of different mice that we put the exact same mutations that we find in our kids into, and then we're able to study those mice to understand uh, more about what kind of problems they're having and also try to understand um, different ways to block the disease process, either using medications or by breeding those mice to a number of different um, specific knockout mice that actually are missing particular genes. And that gives us a much better feel for what's going on in the whole um, process, all the different um, pathways or mechanisms that are going on in this disease. That helps us because we can either try to repurpose other drugs um, that have already been approved or um, try to work with a number of other groups that are good at finding new special targeted drugs that can get, um, get to the pathways that we've um, just figured out. Um, and uh, uh, the goal is to identify drugs that are safe and effective and can be used um, in the same patients that we started with right from the beginning. And we've been successful um, a few different times in doing that. So as I mentioned, um, my training is, a, is an allergist immunologist, and, and, and because of that, um, I end up seeing patients with really two different types of problems, um, all related to the immune system. Um, one type of problem that we see are patients that have what's called immune deficiency. And in that situation, patients have a, a defect or a major problem in their, um, a major defect or a minor defect in their immune system that then makes them more susceptible to infections. Um, that um, it, uh, oftentimes we um, have to treat them with a number of different um, uh, immune uh, uh, enhancers like um, immunoglobulin um, or, or other, um, other type um, things like bone marrow transplants to try to help them uh, make their immune system work like it should. On the other side of the seesaw um, or Cohen <laughs> um, is, is inflammatory diseases. And these are situations like you've been hearing about earlier today that are a situation where you just have too much inflammation in the body. Um, one of the um, kinds of things that's very common in patients that I see a lot are patients that actually have allergies. And in allergies, what you do is you end up making antibodies. And we've heard some about um, different types of antibodies today, but you make uh, particular antibodies to things in the environment that you shouldn't be making antibodies to, like cats or peanuts or, or, or things like that. Um, but that's a situation where, again, you have too much inflammation, your, your immune system is overactivated or unregulated and, and not doing what it's supposed to do. Um, the other sort of classic inflammatory disease is what you've been hearing about today, and that's autoimmunity. Um, and that's a situation where you have antibodies that you make to yourself. Um, your body has a lot of different ways to try to keep you from making those antibodies to yourself, um, but sometimes it doesn't do that great a job at doing it. Um, and so um, patients with autoimmunity have these um, autoantibodies that attack its own tissue, like you've heard about again earlier today. But um, over the last decades, um, there have been a number of patients that didn't quite fit into 
the, um, uh, the category of immune deficiency and inflammation. One of those groups of patients is actually patients that actually have both. And that's something that's been become really challenging over the last several years. And that's patients that have both an immune deficiency, but also because their immune system is not working properly, they also have autoimmunity or really severe allergies. And that puts us doctors in a real bind because we have to be able to block the immune system to try to block um, autoimmunity or allergic disease, but also we need to try to boost the immune system in order to try to protect them from infection. Um, so what we, what the, we call those diseases now is immune dysregulation disorders. But even beyond that, there's a number of other patients that have si significant inflammation but don't fit into the allergy and autoimmunity. And what those patients um, now um, have a home is, is what are called autoinflammatory diseases. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. There's also another term that's been described that's called hyperinflammation, which can come from all three of these different types of immune disorders. So what are autoinflammatory disorders? Um, they are multi-systemic inflammatory diseases. And that just means that there's inflammation in multiple different parts of the body. Um, and it's different, even though they may have some of the same symptoms and even some of the same lab values as patients with autoimmune disease or immune deficiency disorders, they don't have the same underlying problem. Um, what it seems like autoinflammatory diseases um, are a problem with is a dysregulation of a part of the immune system that we call the innate immune system. And those cells that are part of the innate immune system are called neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages. And we don't see as much of a problem in their lymphocytes. Um, and lymphocytes are the, are, the, are the T cells that you've been hearing about earlier, um, but also B cells, which make all the antibodies that we've been talking about earlier. And so in general, these autoinflammatory diseases are different from autoimmune diseases because they don't have involvement or significant involvement of um, the part of the immune system that are lymphocytes and antibody mediated. Now, these diseases were uh, this sort of name, autoinflammatory disease, was first used to describe a few rare disorders. Um, and these rare disorders are called either periodic or hereditary recurrent fever disorders. Um, and that's how it sort of first began with some of these disorders here on the left, the most common of which is one called familial Mediterranean fever. Um, the other one, um, a couple others are hyper IgD syndrome and another one called TRAPS. The one I've been working with for the last 20 years and is, is the disease that got me involved in this whole field is a condition that we called the cryopyrin associated periodic syndrome or CAPS for short. Um, and these patients, all, all of these different um, uh, uh, patients with these different disorders all have a, a, um, a similar situation which they have recurrent fever, um, uh, some de degree of rash, um, some degree of uh, either joint or just muscle or extremity pain, um, and oftentimes other, um, other things as well, like systemic inflammatory problems that involve their eyes, sometimes their brain, and other things like that. So as you can tell, some of those things are what we see in patients with classic autoimmune diseases, and that sort of can, can sometimes cloud the picture, but these disorders are all due to mutations in particular genes that sort of allow for the immune system to go a little bit crazy. So in the beginning, autoinflammatory disease was just used to describe these rare diseases. And now they're actually, instead of just these four, there's actually over 30 different genetic disorders that have been identified um, that are classified as autoinflammation. Um, and, uh, but what's happened even more so in, in the last um, several years is we've begun to realize that autoinflammation also applies to a number of more common diseases, not just genetic diseases that we see. Um, and these disorders are things like gout, pseudogout, um, uh, um, uh, Stills disease, and adult onset Stills disease. Um, by doing all of this, we've been able to, by understanding more about these diseases, we've been able to use a number of different um, blockers for these uh, particular um, diseases. And, and at least in the beginning, most of these um, diseases were all due to a, a, um, a cytokine or a protein called interleukin-1. And so now there's three FDA-approved therapies that are used in a lot of these autoinflammatory hereditary fever disorders. Um, I wanna just mention that um, to learn more about autoinflammation, there's a, a website called the Autoinflammatory Alliance that can have, has lots of different resources for um, doctors, for um, patients. Um, uh, and, uh, and there's actually on that website, uh, a, a, a search where you can put in your symptoms and it will tell you sort of which of the different autoinflammatory diseases you fit into.
Here's a couple other resources as well. Um, here's that search that I was talking about where you just type in your symptoms and it actually, I'm not saying you don't need doctors anymore, but it actually um, is, a, is a nice situation where you can actually get a feel for what might be going on with you. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, uh, thank you, Hal. So, uh, so I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, that's not related exactly to what you were talking about, but I'm always curious about it because I teach undergrads immunology and this question always comes up. So uh, celiac disease, is it auto inflammation, allergy, or is it more of a, you know, autoimmune disease? Because I think a lot of times, like in our text, it says it's an autoimmunity, but what do you think? Yeah, um, that's a good one because I, I, I mean, I think it depends on if you're a lumper or, or, a, or a splitter. Um, so... I think you know we 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 know that that patients do. There's different types of of, of issues with gluten. Um, I think some of it is antibody mediated. I don't think it's usually allergic mediated, although there are you can be actually allergic to wheat. Um, but clearly, um, nothing's that simple. And, and I think the innate immune system is also potentially involved in celiac disease as well as as well as sort of a lot of just issues with gut function, um, uh, which play a part. So. I would say celiac is one of those that probably needs its own classification, but it probably fits into a number of different um, different groups. And it's a good question. Okay, other other questions either from the, the guests or the panelists for Dr. Hoffman. Actually, maybe while, while we're waiting for that, um, just curious about when, when patients first come in, you know, the, and you don't actually know, you haven't had time to really figure out what's happening. Do you generally put them onto some sort of general immunosuppressive drugs like corticosteroids or something? I mean, how do you how do you handle it before you actually know what's really the cause? Yeah, a lot of times by the time they make it to me, they have actually tried a number of different things. Um, steroids are obviously the sort of big guns that are used um, and, and sort of block the immune system. Interestingly, for a lot of the auto-inflammatory diseases, steroids aren't a great choice. Um, no. Yeah, you'll get some effect if you use high doses, but in a lot of the patients that I have worked with over the years, um, you don't get um, great responses from corticosteroids. And, and, and in fact, you get more side effects than you do actually benefit. Um, and so, uh, so, so yes, taking, getting a good history and finding out what medicines have worked for them and what medicines haven't actually is, is really important. And like a lot of things um, in, in, uh, from rheumatology and from allergy immunology, we sometimes have to just you know, give a medicine to see what happens. Cause the best way to figure out, sometimes the best way to figure out what's going on in a particular patient um, is to give them a particular medicine that targets one, one thing. And as long as that medicine is safe and as long as you can sort of get it to the patient um, that can teach you a lot more than sometimes blood tests or genetic tests or, or, or things like that. So we, we do commonly sort of try, you know, and I guess that's why they call it the practice of medicine. Um, but, uh, but we, um, and, and I, I don't want it to sound like we just sort of throw little things here and there. There's a lot of thought involved, but, um, yeah. but a lot of that does happen where we sort of have to do therapeutic trials to see if the medicine works. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you guys, all of you. Emily, you want to finish this up? Yeah, thank you all so much. What a wonderful day today. So many uh, very fantastic presentations, so very informative. So thank you so very much to our to our host, Dr. Walsh, to all of our wonderful members of our SAV, our scholars for their presentations today. Uh, and special thanks to BMS for their support of this program and to all of you for joining us. Uh, we hope that you stay uh, in touch with us and uh, stay tuned for more information. Thank you again. Have a great day. Take care, everybody.